but I do want to welcome you all. I'm Reverend Tracy Miramuska, the Minister for Mid and Later Life, and I am really excited to be here with my friend Leslie, who is uh, one of the members of the Adult Christian Ed Committee and is a retired faculty member, and I'd love for him to provide more detail about himself as he um, launches into this very interesting presentation about something that I know I know very little about and I'm excited to learn. So thank you so much for being here, Leslie. Well, thank you very much, Tracy. Uh, <clears throat> I don't think I really need much introduction since I've been a member of the church for so long. But as you know, I was at Trinity College and I taught uh, in the religious studies department uh, some 40 years. So, uh, but I'm really very pleased to be a member of the church. It's been a wonderful, wonderful experience to be in the church. The church services, the preaching, the music, uh, everything that uh, I've participated in has just absolutely very, very inspiring. And um, it's a wonderful opportunity really to be in the church. Um, some years ago, I went to a meeting of the um, Caribbean Studies Association, because that's my field, Caribbean studies. Um, actually, I study the religions of the Caribbean. And uh, uh, Stephen Glazier and I, he was one of my former students, was teaching at the uh, University of Nebraska. And we were together in Curacao for the meeting. And we decided we'd skip out of the meeting and go wandering about through the, the town. And so we walked around uh, Williamstadt, which is the capital of Curacao, and we ran across this big, huge yellow building. And in front of it, there was a sign and it was a synagogue. And I had never expected to find a synagogue in the Caribbean at the time. So lo and behold, it was open. So we went inside and visited and I'll show you some pictures that I took while I was there. But that's how I got interested into this. But the whole field actually of, uh, um, Jew Judaism in the Caribbean remained kind of dormant for many, many years because I was preoccupied with other things that I was doing and I was teaching and so on. But once I retired and once I came close to retirement, I went back to it um, and discovered much, much more, which I would like to share with you uh, tonight. And that's what, uh, um, that's what this is gonna be about. What I discovered is this, is that the history of Judaism in the Caribbean is really very old. It actually goes back to the to the 15th, end of the 15th century. Um, when Christopher Columbus came over, he had two Jews on board. One, I don't know the name of the second one, but the first one, his name was Luis Torres. Uh, and there have been, uh, Navy scholars have probably even thought that perhaps Christopher Columbus himself might have been Jewish. Um, a lot of modern contemporary scholars are saying that, and the reason is because he actually was born in Genoa in uh, Italy and then moved to Spain, but he lived in a Jewish neighborhood and all of his friends were Jewish and they, they helped him actually paid money, give him some money to do the trip across to the Americas. I mean, he, of course, he obtained, obtained money also from Queen Isabella, but uh, something happened during that uh, the time that he left. It was 1492, as you know, and uh, this was the beginning of the Inquisition in Spain. So a lot of Jews were getting out of Spain because they were being persecuted. Um, and uh, so Christopher Columbus sails out from, um, as you know, with the three ships, he leaves Spain, and then he goes to, uh, to Hispaniola, which today is Haiti, and that's where he lands on December 6, 1492. Um, but what happened in Spain is that a lot of the Jews in Spain had to get out. So they went to neighboring Portugal and there were somewhere between 20,000 to 100,000 Jews who went to neighboring Portugal. And um, that they were welcome, but, in, in, but while they were there, uh, it so happened that uh, the king of Portugal, that is his son, uh, because it was Jao II died and his son, Manuel the Fortunate came on the throne in 1496. And he asked the uh, hand in marriage of the daughter of Isabella of Spain. And Isabella said, okay, you can have my daughter as a wife. However, you must do one thing. You have to kick the Jews out of Portugal and you have to uh, enact the inquisition in Portugal. So he had about 100,000 Jews who had moved from Spain to Portugal 
Now what happens is that with the Inquisition, they have got out again, and this time they went to Northern Europe. A lot of them went to cities like Rouen in France, others went to Marseille, um, and, um, but the Bayonne, Bordeaux is another one. But the majority, and some of them went to London, but the majority actually went to Amsterdam of all places because there was a thriving, flourishing Jewish community in Amsterdam. Others found passage and they turned out to uh, go to uh, Central America or South America, but there are very, very few of them. But the majority of them actually went to Amsterdam. Well, turn the clock forward. In the 16th century, um, you know, Spain and Portugal really dominated the seas. There was a lot of piracy, precious gold being brought back to Europe. So there were a lot of pirates that were actually pillaging uh, some of the Portuguese and Spanish ships. And um, as um, this was going on, um, what happened in 1630 is that the Portuguese, the Dutch, the reason why I mentioned the pirates is because um, the, the, um, uh, the Portuguese had to have certain places where they could launch attacks on the pirate ships. So they happen to have settled in two places. And one of them is Recife. Uh, let's see if I can, can you locate Recife? In there, it's on the East Coast. If you read, read Salvador de Bahia, Arajaju, Marcello, and then Recife and Olinda. Can you see that, those two towns? So um, Leslie, if you go to slideshow, that drop down menu with the slideshow, yeah. and then you go to start at current slide, it will blow the slide up a little bigger for us. Oh, okay. Well, let's see. Maybe I can do it this way. Yeah, you got this. Is that okay? Sure, but for your other slides too, you might like to have it in slideshow view. Okay, well, I don't know how to do that. You just explained it, but. Oh, it's okay. Um, so if you go under, you see under the, the menu up top, it says slideshow. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. And then just start the show and then. And I, want, um, I want to keep this on the side. Okay, perfect. That's fine yeah. then. So I want to keep that on the side. Okay, sorry to interrupt. So, okay, can you now see Recife and Olinda? Okay, so this is where this is where a lot of the uh, the Portuguese settled right there. That happened in 1630. Well, um, about the, the same time, the Dutch moved in and kicked the Portuguese out. So both Olinda and Recife became Dutch colonies. Well, you may I just told you that there were a lot of Jews up in Amsterdam. So what do you think happened? A lot of the Jews in Amsterdam migrated to Brazil. And they went to Olinda, and quite a few of them actually. After a while, there were 20, um, two, only nearly 3,000 um, Dutch people living in uh, Recife and Olinda. And uh, out of them, 1,500 of them were, were Dutch, uh, Dutch Jews who lived there. And um, so when they settled that, most of them were traders. Uh, but they did very well for themselves. They established a, a, a community um, and they called the community Zur Israel, meaning the rock of Israel that established itself in Brazil. And uh, while they were there in 1645, the Portuguese came back and killed, kicked out the Dutch and enacted the Inquisition, uh, both in Recife and Olinda which meant then that the Jews had to get out of there and they went elsewhere throughout the Caribbean. Um, so this is a picture of the Caribbean, as you can see. So these are the lesser Antilles and these are the larger Antilles right there, Cuba, Jamaica, and Hispaniola, which has Haiti on one side, the Dominican Republic is on the east side. And a lot of them actually migrated when they left Recife Brazil would be south of Venezuela. And so they took a ship and they settled in an island uh, called Curaçao. And uh, the thing, the, the capital would have been Williamstadt. So I'll make it a little bigger so you can see it. Um, you can see Curaçao. Can you see it now? 
Oops. There it is. Yeah. There, Curaçao. It's a tiny island right there. And the capital is Willemstad. And these are Dutch islands. Actually, they are provinces uh, of, of Netherlands, of the Netherlands. Um, so a lot of them went there and settled there because these, you know, the, the Dutch were already there. So, but some of them ended up in Jamaica. Um, and they referred to the, the when this community there in Jamaica called itself the Portugals. That's how they called themselves. But they were Dutch Jews actually, who had migrated from Portugal to Amsterdam and then finally to Recife and, and uh, Olinda and from there into Jamaica. Uh, and when, um, when they arrived there, there is Jamaica. Okay. The, um, Portuguese government was so uh, eager to get the Jews out of Recife and Olinda that they sent some ships, about 16 ships, to pick up all the Jews that were there to bring them back to, um, to Amsterdam. Well, 15 ships left Olinda and uh, ended up in Amsterdam. And they did that quite successfully. Ah, but the 16th ship ran into a storm and it was pushed by the storm and ended up in Jamaica. And that's where they formed this organization, you know, this community or this community called the Portugals. Um, so others, of course, went to uh, Curaçao, as I said. And while they were there in, um, in um, and from Jamaica and, and from Curaçao, then a lot of them migrated to other places like Hispaniola, and they ended up all the way up to St. Thomas. St. Thomas at the time was a Danish colony. Uh, if you know, the United States actually bought St. Thomas and St. Vincent from, from Denmark, and it became part of the United States. Um, so a lot of them ended up there, and I'll show you the synagogue later on uh, in, um, in uh, St. Thomas, uh, US Virgin Islands. Um, so, um, so that the, the thing that, that happened is that the synagogue they established were not the Ashkenazi, which is Northern Europe. It was the Spanish sect or the Spanish denomination or branch of Judaism. And uh, that branch is called the Sephardic. It's the Sephardic tradition and not the Ashkenazi tradition. Well, there are some differences in the theology and also in the synagogues themselves between synagogue of the Sephardic and the Ashkenazi. As I said, Ashkenazi is Northern Europe. And so the differences are, and perhaps the marked difference is this, is that this is the synagogue in St. Thomas. It's the oldest US synagogue. Um, it, I mean, yeah, it is actually the oldest US synagogue. Uh, and it is in St. Thomas in Charlotte Amalie, but look, it has a sand floor. That's the first characteristic that makes it different from the Ashkenazi synagogue. All the Sephardic synagogues have, have sand floors. And the idea of the sand floor, the tradition had it in the sand floor that the sand muffled the sounds of the conversation, the steps and the singing and the prayers during the time of the inquisition. That's the tradition. Uh, and that's why they kept the sand floor. And that passed on to the tradition so that it was passed on even after they had left Portugal and left Spain, had gone through up to Dutch and came to the new world. They still kept this tradition of, of uh, having a synagogue with a, de de with a sand floor. The other reason why they have the sand floor is theological and biblical, because these are people who saw themselves as wandering through the desert and just as the children of Israel wandered through the desert and they were fed and taken care of by God and that the Lord was there with them, they felt that the same thing would happen to them. As they wandered through the, mid, the, the new world, the Caribbean, going from island to island in South America and Brazil and so on, they felt that they were wandering uh, through the desert and that someday they would return back to Jerusalem. There was a fellow who, um, was actually uh, Portuguese in 1658. 
uh, who writes, um, and this is what he says when he's describing the community um, in Jamaica. Uh, and this is what he says in 1658. He writes, he, we shall thank God that he has delivered us from the hell of snow. Uh, I have to agree with him. I, I wish I could say the same thing. And who has brought us in peace to this beautiful country. After many, many years, we shall lay our bodies to rest till the time, he says, has come when we shall gather all of us in the fatherland. Fatherland is Jerusalem. So you see, that was the idea. They were really saw themselves as the children of Israel wandering through the desert. And someday they would go back then to Israel. The, uh, so that was the other meaning of the sand floor. There were two meanings to it, to the sand floor. There are many synagogues with sand floors in the Caribbean, and these include, and I'll show you pictures of them, the um, Neve Shalom and Zadek Ve uh, Shalom in uh, Suriname. Uh, I'll show you a picture of that. There is a St. Thomas again, at the synagogue with a sand floor. Uh, there it is. But this is a synagogue in Suriname. It's a very huge building, as you can see. Um, Suriname, of course, is on the northern coast of South America. It's right next to uh, Venezuela. And this is another picture of it. But I took the, I, I wanted you to see this, this is a Jewish uh, uh, cemetery, but I just wanted you to observe something. What do you see next to the synagogue? to the left, to your left. What is it? A mosque. That's correct. That's absolutely correct. So all of these differences and the tension between Judaism and Islam is not a problem in the Caribbean. They live side by side. On Friday nights, the Jews go to do their thing, their services, and on whatever Thursday, then the Muslims do their thing. And they, they you know, it's not a problem. Uh, at all in the Caribbean. And they live as really in, in the real uh, world of, of, of that part of the world as brothers and sisters uh, without any difficulty, any problem. The other characteristic of the synagogue, this is inside the Paranaibo um, the synagogue. If you look inside, it's because it's upstairs. The women are the one who sit upstairs. The men sit downstairs. So there is a difference. And uh, again, you find a sand floor, as you can see. The other characteristic is that everything is done in a square. So it all surrounds uh, the pulpit, which is usually uh, near or in or in near the center uh, of the room. Okay, so one other characteristic of the synagogues of the Sephardic synagogue is that it usually has four poles. And they're important, you can't see them here, but they're actually four poles. Uh, maybe I'll show them in another slide. Uh, here's, here are two of them. And uh, these four poles actually uh, are represents the four women in the Bible, Sarah, Rachel, Rebecca, and Leah. And each one of, them, each one of these poles has a name, actually. Um, another difference between the, let's see, and this is a synagogue in the Curacao. When I was there, I took the picture. It's a rather very huge building, quite large building, as you can see. One of the things about a lot of the synagogues, uh, as it was in the, in the Inquisition, is that they built a wall, and that was to protect the Jews inside because of the Inquisition. And so you find, it's not true in the New World, but you do find a lot of Sephardic synagogues usually often have a wall to protect the synagogue. That's the, this is a picture of the um, inside, the synagogue uh, in uh, Curacao. As you can see, I showed you that this is that this building right there, that's the inside. It's the Mikveh Israel synagogue. Um, and there is also uh, the other the difference between the Ashkenazi and, um, and, the, uh, and the Sephardic has to do with dietary restrictions. Uh, the Ashkenazi abstain from consuming foodstuff. Uh, that is a subject of fermentation. 
and therefore to leavening, whereas the Sephardic don't pay attention to that. They consume rice, they consume beans and various nuts and all sorts of foods that in fact can go during Passover. Uh, um, uh, whereas in the Ashkenazi um, sect, they cannot consume these things that uh, in food stock that um, actually ferment. Another difference between the two is that is in the language that used in the rituals. In the Ashkenazi, of course, they use the Hebrew. In Sephardic, they use a language that was called Ladino, L-A-D-I-N-O. And the Ladino actually is still being used in some parts of Europe, Southern Europe, in the synagogues, the Sephardic synagogue, and also in Northern Africa, Morocco was being one of them. And the Sephardic Jews, Ladino. The Ladino is a language that's a mixture of Spanish, Portuguese, and Hebrew. Um, and so Ladino is a language that's used in the Sephardic synagogue, but not used in the Ashkenazi, which uses the Hebrew. And the melody is also going to be different. The music is very different. Um, the uh, music itself is uh, in the, both the synagogue in the Sephardic and also in the Ashkenazi. The music is in Hebrew. Interestingly enough, they've kept that. Uh, but the Ladino is uh, used for the rest of, of the ritual. So that would be a very important difference between the two. And of course, the music itself took a different form depending on where um, that synagogue is. If it's going to be in Puerto Rico, for example, uh, the music is going to be a little different. The rhythm would be different. The music is going to be different than, say, Curacao. So the music, as it uh, develops in different synagogues, is going to take the idiom of the, if it's an environment, as it were. But the Sephardic tradition really lasted a long time in the Caribbean. Um, and there were most of the Jews actually uh, who were in the Caribbean um, were very respectful of the tradition and they followed the tradition very strictly. Even navigators wore the shawls during the, the Sabbath and we did their prayers. One thing I forgot to tell you is that the, the Jews in the Caribbean became extremely uh, powerful and also very wealthy. And um, they helped build three synagogues in the United States. I don't know whether you know that. Uh, the one is the big one in South Carolina, Charleston, South Carolina. The other one is a synagogue in, um, I'll show you the picture of it in a minute. It's a synagogue, a large synagogue in New York. It's a big one in New York. And the third one is the synagogue, the old synagogue, in the Turo Synagogue in Long Island, right? Some of you may have visited that synagogue, but the money that built that synagogue, a lot of the money actually came from Caribbean Jews. There are also other synagogues uh, built. Um, there's a synagogue in Jamaica, in Kingston, Jamaica, which also has a sun floor uh, to this day, and it's still operating today um, in Jamaica. And then there is also the synagogue, as I said, the St. Thomas, which is the first synagogue in the United States. It's a rather small one. I showed you a picture of it earlier. If you remember, I can go back and I can show you the picture. That's, that's it, that's the inside right there, right? If you remember, but that's the synagogue right there. Um, so, um, and then the other New York, the new synagogue in New York, I don't know if I have a picture of that, I should. Uh, I had this all in order, believe it or not, I did. Anyway, well, I'm sure I'm sure I ran into it. Um, but these are the, these different uh, synagogues. Now, one of the things that they were successful of doing, despite the difficulties that they had, persecution, even in the Caribbean, they were able to maintain a lot of the uh, records and archives and also records. So you had, for example, cemeteries, which today a lot of them, this is a cemetery in Jamaica that's falling into pieces, but um, uh, because they're, they're not really taken care of, but some are very, very old. And, but they were able to keep track of all the people who died. And even to this day, you could go to the archives and find a lot of record of uh, Spanish Jews and Portuguese Jews who migrated um, there. One thing that I found was interesting 
is that in Jewish cemeteries, you don't usually have icons. But in this case, I found icons in Jewish cemetery, which is a no-no in Jewish tradition. And I suspect the reason why that was the case is because it's carry over from, from the Inquisition, that they have those icons there in order to fool people uh, and to make them think that perhaps that um, there were Christians being buried there, uh, when in fact they were Jews. Here is another example of it right there. And again, another example of that in Barbados. Um, some example, further example of that of Jewish, but you'd see there's, if you look, you could see an, an angel in the middle panel that's there, but you don't find that in Jewish synagogues, not at all. You don't usually find icons or pictures at all. The one that I found was extraordinary is a Jewish uh, cemetery um, in Jamaica. And that one is very, very, almost completely, you'd think you, that this is a Christian grave, but it's not. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a Jewish, uh, Jewish grave. Um, there is the picture of the um, Turo synagogue, if you remember, that was built, the money of which was built by, partly by uh, a Caribbean Jews. Um, uh, and by the way, when the ship, the 16th ship left Brazil and went to, um, ended up in Jamaica because it was caught in a storm, it actually later departed Jamaica and went to New Amsterdam. And New Amsterdam at the time would have been New York City. And so a lot of the Caribbean Jews who were Portuguese had gone through da, uh, um, Holland, then to Brazil, then to Jamaica, then to Jamaica, and then ended up in New York City. This is the inside. It's a beautiful synagogue inside. Gertrude and I have been there, and it really is. It's a. It's just a lovely place. It's serene, very quiet, and again, you have the same tradition here. The women sit upstairs and the men sit downstairs. The only difference here in the synagogue is that it doesn't have a sand floor. Um, the one in New York does not have a sand floor either. So they seem to have departed from that, at least in the United States. There is the synagogue in New York, New York City, on the east side in New York City. Um, and then this, that's the inside of it. As you can see, is a red carpet. They have done away with the uh, with a with a sand floor there as well. But you still have the four poles. I mean, the poles are there to hold the buildings, but there are actually four of them, large ones, that uh, represents the four women um, in the Bible. There have been some effort recently to reconstruct uh, the tradition because it's uh, beginning. It was beginning to disappear, especially the cemetery, and the Jews in the synagogue and in the synagogues have launched the calls. I, I, I got a call a year ago to actually go to Jamaica to help repair some of the graves. But here are two people there from the United States who came and then they're, they've been repairing a lot of the uh, Jewish cemeteries, as you can see, and then putting them back in, uh, in, in order. There was another picture of it. Um, but the Jewish um, tradition in the Caribbean is um, a somewhat, it's, it's been weakened a lot. It's a decrease for a variety of reasons. Um, and the reason is because a lot of Jewish people send their children to study abroad and the kids don't come back. The other reason is because there has been a lot of intermarriage with Gentiles, that is with Christians. And when that happens, a lot of Jewish people, uh, Jewish uh, men uh, usually or women end up living in uh, other neighborhoods other than Jewish neighborhoods. So what has happened is it's been a dislocation in the tradition and a lot of the tradition has actually uh, been lost. The other reason is that a lot of young people who no longer understand Ladino, the language, have stayed away from the synagogue because they don't understand it. So recently um, in the synagogues, particularly one in Jamaica, uh, where I have I've gone, uh, they've changed to, to English because of that. Um, but there are still some very active synagogues in the Caribbean. Uh, there are some uh, 10 or 13 synagogues in Puerto Rico. Um, and um, Barbados has synagogues, Martinique, Guadeloupe, um, and as I mentioned, St. Thomas. Um, but here is a good picture of a service. 
in the synagogue. And the rabbi, as you see, is a black Jamaican. And they also have um, camps during the summer for the children. These are Jews, uh, Jewish children. And they're very successful camp during the summer for the kids, uh, as you can see here. Um, I'm going to end uh, by uh, showing you a short video. Tracy, wish me luck. I keep my fingers crossed. I hope it will work. Um, I'm sure you need some help. Yeah, okay. So I'll do my best, okay? So here we go. Uh, this is a woman on the beach. She's Jewish and she's talking about her. Can you see it? You cannot see it. Not yet. If you want to stop sharing, I did pull it up and I have it ready to go. Okay, please do. Okay, so if you want to go up to the top and do the stop sharing button. It's red. Yeah, right I know. At the I very see. top. Okay. okay. So let me share with my sound. Is this is the video, correct? Yeah, that's it. Right okay, there. great. So give me a shout if it doesn't seem to be coming through properly. Okay. Okay, go ahead. What? And your name? My name is Miss Hannah Diana Levy, third. I am the great granddaughter of first Hannah Glaze and the second granddaughter of first Hannah Watson. My mother is Leonie Levy. She married the son of J Uriah Augustus Levy, James Roy Levy. And my great grandfather is John Watson, John Alberta Watson from Scotland, Dundee. They came to live in Jamaica. They were producers who produce crops and send it back to Scotland and Israel. I live in Mount Peace, Lucy, Hanover. And my brother is Joshua Michael Levy, Percival Levy. We are the tribe for we are from the tribe of Levites. And we are we will represent the Bible called the Bible. I would like to contact the Jewish people. I'm 43 years now and I've never met the Jewish nation as Moses met them when he was 40 years old. And if they can contact me, I have a phone number that I will give you when you are finished. I also live on the royal estate of John Watson and Hannah Watson, 51 acres of land. We are farmers. My ancestors, Edward Glaze, my great grandfather, he was from Palestine, Israel, the Gaza Strip. But he came to live in Jamaica. At that time, a lot of people were living in Montego Bay, a lot of Jewish people. Today, a few, they moved to Kingston. I live in Hanover, Lucy, it's my town. But there's not much Jewish people here. So for me, it is hard to know my Jewish tradition. Very good. It was a pleasure meeting you. Yes. And your, and your handiwork. Yes, I'll give you my number. Okay, so that, uh, that's it. But I wanted to show you that. So there are, there are still some Jews um, and people who know their ancestors. And that's one of the things that there are several Jewish organizations who are actually right now, in particular in Jamaica and St. Thomas, who are working very, very hard to make sure that people who have Jewish ancestry to retrace their ancestry. And one of these organizations, which has been quite successful, is called the Caribbean Jewish Congress, um, which is uh, operating in St. Thomas. And then there is also the United Congregation of Israelites, uh, which is in, uh, in Jamaica. And they've uh, actually created archives. Uh, so there's been quite a bit of movement right now among people in Jamaica and various places throughout the Caribbean in trying to trace back a lot of their ancestry. So hopefully the future is gonna look bright for uh, Jews in the Caribbean uh, because people are being very interested in their background, interested in the tradition. So there is a possibility that uh, Judaism, uh, the practice of Judaism will increase in the Caribbean uh, again. There seem to be a lot of young people interested and in participating now in the synagogue as well. So I'll stop and then I'll let you do ask questions if you need to. Thank you so much, Leslie. And I did mute everyone. So if you have a question, I invite you to unmute yourself and speak up or you can wave a hand or um, put a question in the chat. Oh, I see Jack, how about you? It's not more of a question than a comment. You talked about the Ladino language and 
It's actually really hard to sing. I've done a little bit of it, but that combination of Spanish and Portuguese and Hebrew, it's not an intuitive language when you're looking at it transliterated on a page. It's, it's really hard to sing, but beautiful. Why is it so hard to sing? That, that, uh... It's not, if you're used to, you know, very phonetic languages like Latin or Spanish or anything like that, this, this does not, uh, those, the knowledge of those languages do not help you if you're looking at this language. Because oh. it, if, similar to French where there's a lot of silent letters. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I would know that well. <laughs> French. But, um... Did you sing that in connection with a Sephardic uh, synagogue? Uh, no, it was part of a it was part of a a program of Jewish music. I see. Yeah. Thank you, Jack. And I love hearing your dog in the background too. Um, <laughs> are there any other questions or comments or reflections? Yeah, uh, Carol has a question, I think. Oh, go ahead, Carol. I'm curious, Leslie, to know how you got interested in this in the beginning. Yeah, I was saying earlier, I, I was on a, I had gone to a conference of the Caribbean Studies Association, which always meets in the Caribbean every May. And so um, I have a student whose name is Stephen Grazier, who taught and was chair of the anthropology department at the uh, University of Nebraska. And then once a year we would meet together at uh, at this you know this one one of these islands in the Caribbean for the meeting. And we had never been to Curacao, so we decided to skip out of the meeting and then wandered about through uh, the city of Williamstadt. And we went across this uh, the synagogue, um, Sephardic synagogue, the functioning synagogue. And so we got inside, and I became very interested in it. And about five or six years ago, Gertrude and I were on a cruise. And we stopped at St. Thomas. And uh, I had read about the synagogue in St. Thomas and the whole family was together actually. And I forced everyone, <laughs> made them walk up that hill all the way up to the top to go visit the little synagogue in St. Thomas. And again, I became uh, very interested in what I was looking at. And as I said, through the years, I had to put this aside because I, I was involved with other, other things that I was doing, teaching and, you know, I would research other sort of thing. But um, uh, once I retired, I thought, well, I'll go back to it. And so I've been doing a lot of work on this mm. recently. But there's a new book that just came out about three weeks ago. I don't have it, I don't know if I have it. Yeah, there it is. I just started to read it, but it's, um, can you see it? Yes. Yeah, so it's a Jewish uh, history of the Jews in, in, in Haiti. Um, I was aware that there were Jews and they're still Jews, they're Jewish families in Haiti, there are very few of them. But uh, Haiti is a very strong Catholic country and the Jews have really had a very hard time. There's a, there was been a law in Haiti that there were to be no synagogues in Haiti. Oh. Uh, that, yeah, yeah, that's a law. So the Jews continue to meet, but they still to this day, they are meeting at homes. And you walk into the home, you'd never know that uh, all the kind of libraries, everything will be put aside, so you never know. But go on Friday nights, uh, then you, you would find all the ritual paraphernalia would be there and they would do the services in the homes. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are the Castra family and a number of Bulos family, a number of the families. They all really, they're Jewish families. They're Jewish cemeteries in the Northern part of the country, um, but they are in pretty bad shape. Nobody has done anything with them since the 19th century. So as they're overgrown with, uh, um, you know, with weeds and, and so on. But um, uh, the Jews in Haiti have had a very, very difficult time of it. And then there is a very sad ritual that they do every year in some of the small towns. Um, and I'm really quite ashamed actually of it. It's, it's so an ugly thing. But uh, every year in some of the small town, not the main city, but some of the small towns, uh, they have a, um, 
a stuff um, person, uh, you know, in form of a person. Uh, usually, it's it's uh, you know that that they sit on a chair, and then uh, this happens. They do this on Good Friday, and so the community comes along with whips and rocks, and they have a ritual where they hit the Jew for killing Jesus. So they they bring branches and they you know they uh, whip and and this this thing this figure uh, that uh, they do. And then at the end of the ritual, they burn it. And the ritual is actually called burn the Jew. Uh, it, it's a terrible, terrible, terrible thing. Um, but the Jews have been very, very much persecuted in Haiti. Whereas in the Dominican Republic, it's been the exact opposite. Uh, Trujillo, who was president from 1930, 1929, all the way up to, I believe, 1960, 62, I think. Um, he was a dictator during the Second World War, when a lot of the Jews were being persecuted in Europe, he opened his doors to, to the Jews uh, so that they could come and seek asylum in the Dominican Republic. Uh, but when they came at one condition, they had to have children with black women. And what he was conducting is an experiment in eugenics. And, um, and so, uh, in, in, in return, he would reward them by giving them land uh, for farming or give them special position in government and so on. So uh, and that's one of the reasons why a lot of people in the Dominican Republic are much lighter skin than the people in Haiti. Mm -hmm. But now I have to tell you, the US actually congratulated and rewarded Trujillo for accepting the Jews after the Second World War, because this was a, a, a you know an, an act uh, that was uh, essentially to to save the Jews from uh, uh, Nazi furnaces. But that's what the United States did and thought that Turia was doing is different from what he himself was doing, because his whole notion that a black-skinned person was a person who was inferior. He was very racist. Uh, although himself, he was um, a dark skinned person, but he used a chemical to lighten his skin all his life. Um, but as president, he had a light skin, but he had to keep putting on this chemical. Um, but he was very concerned about the fact that his, his people were black and that he wanted to lighten the skin by conducting this experiment. But there are synagogues in the Dominican Republic and they function quite well. Leslie, did a lot of Jews in, in Germany, uh, uh, did they migrate there originally? Do uh, you have anything you can add to, the, to that? Yeah, I mean, during the Second World War, uh, a lot of the Jews came from Germany and they migrated to the Dominican Republic. I suspect that, I think there were also Jews who migrated in various parts of the Caribbean as well. Um, I remember my brother used to tell me that there was a Jewish family who lived down the street. Um, and um, he said that uh, on Friday night, they used to have meetings. My brother who was young, didn't know what was going on, but there were a lot of cars parked outside on Friday evenings. And he thinks perhaps that they were having a service. Um, so yes, so there are some Jews who, who migrated apart from the Dominican Republic, who also migrated to other parts of the Caribbean as well, yes. Uh, Leslie, question: Do you know whether the the Jews in the Caribbean are they where do they fall on the spectrum in terms of uh, reformed or orthodox, anything like that? Uh, apart from some of them that are still uh, Sephardic, like the um, Curacao um, and uh, Saint Thomas, for example, uh, they are really reformed. And the reform tradition has been brought in from the United States. At one point, the, um, uh, the, the, the rabbi in the Jewish synagogue in Jamaica was an American, an American Jew, um, rabbi. He was very, very, very young. He was probably in his late 30s, early 40s. Um, so uh, he and his wife uh, settled in Jamaica. So the reform tradition has been brought in uh, to, to the Caribbean. 
there are very few differences between Ashkenazi. I mean, apart from the difference that I mentioned, there are very few others. So um, if, if the Sephardic uh, synagogues decided to abandon Ladino and then adopted Hebrew, you wouldn't be able to tell that much difference between the two the tradition, other than the fact that physically you still have the columns that were there. I bet you also has the women upstairs and the men downstairs, but it's not at all unusual in Orthodox Jewish tradition anyway for people to be decide, to be divided by sex. So that's that's not a that's not an issue. But you would not know really that you were in a Sephardic synagogue if you didn't have a cent floor. So uh, and as long as you use Hebrew. So, um, but the Reform tradition when it came in, it was just they accepted with uh, with open arms. In fact, it turned out to be something that a young a lot of young people accepted uh, because it was a great deal more uh, contemporary. Uh, than than the, the old Sephardic tradition, but there are still Sephardic Jews in the Caribbean, uh, as I mentioned. Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm curious, Leslie. Would you say then that like Judaism in the Caribbean is on the decline, or is it resurging? Is it maintaining its own? Yeah, it is on the decline, but just very recently, I'd say the past 10 years or so, it's, uh, it's been resurging. And as I, I mentioned, you know, you saw the children at camp, people are very interested in their ancestry and they'll be tracing back their ancestry. They're learning about the tradition. So there is, I think, a very bright future, but it's gonna take a very long time. Yeah, but uh, that this, it's, it's returning, it's coming back. But for a while there, it was almost disappearing and a lot of the, um, synagogues uh, became museums. For example, in Jamaica, there are two Jewish synagogues. One of them now is a museum. It's, uh, it's not used anymore. Uh, the one that I showed you, uh, the white building, if you remember, that's a functioning synagogue. It's still a functioning synagogue. And they're quite uh, successful, actually. The successful and thriving community, a lot of young people there. But Judaism is very old in the Caribbean. That's what I'm trying to say, you know. Uh, and as I said, uh, some scholars today believe that even Christopher Columbus himself might have been Jewish, that he was not Catholic. But he was hiding his Catholicism because of the Inquisition early on uh, in the 15th, 15th century. But as he came, as I mentioned, there were two Jews on board uh, as I mentioned, one of them whose name was Luis Torre. I don't know Torres. I don't know the other one's name. I don't think anybody knows. Um, but they were the first Jews who came to the Caribbean and landed on the Santa Maria uh, and landed in on Hispaniola, which today would have been Haiti. Thank you. Um, Leslie, I was just wondering if um, most people in the Caribbean are religious, and if so, how the different religions break up as far as percentages, and what percentage of the people are Jewish. Wow, I am not sure I, I, I know how to answer that. Part of the reason is because I don't ever remember uh, any, um, any and any statistics uh, about this. So I can't really tell you, but I think it would vary. Let me put it this way. Wherever you have the, the Catholics, you're gonna have very few Jews because the Catholics have all have persecuted the Jews and made it things very difficult for them. Not now, but in the past, historically, especially in places like Martinique. I mean, in the 17th and 18th century, the Jews in Martinique suffered a great deal. Land was taken away from them. And since they didn't have any land, I mean, they had no place to go. So a lot of them left Martinique, um, but that was later fixed. But the Catholic church was very much part of that uh, in uh, not allowing uh, the Jews from owning land in Martinique. So there, uh, the Catholics really have been very pretty tough in the Jewish communities. But I, I guess I'm not really answering your question because I, I don't know. But I can tell you that uh, the percentage of the Jewish population in the Caribbean 
is probably very small. Um, what you have in the Caribbean now are the Catholics and the Spanish and um, the French areas like Martinique, Guadeloupe, Haiti, uh, St. Martin is all French, the French Caribbean, French speaking. Um, Haiti is the only one that's independent, but the other ones are actually provinces of France. And uh, if you go to St. Martin, you know, the French flag is there because you're actually in France when you go to St. Martin and they use a Euro. Um, so, the, but if you're going to places like Jamaica, uh, it's, the percentage is probably a little higher, but in Jamaica, it's probably not more than 2%, I'd say. I don't think it's that much actually. So it's not very large. Um, St. Thomas has a good strong community, but I don't know how large that is either. I don't think there's ever been a, any statistics published about that. So Nancy, I'm sorry, I can't answer that question. I know that there's a thriving, lots of thriving communities in Puerto Rico. There, there are some like 13 synagogues in Puerto Rico and they're, they're functioning synagogues. So if you're gonna Thank find you. probably more synagogues there and then you'll find in, and more communities and more Jews in, in uh, there than you're gonna find elsewhere in the Caribbean. Last year, I believe you did a program on voodoo. Yeah. And uh, is that one of the religions of the Caribbean? Would well, you consider it, would, it? It would be a religion in Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And of course, the United States as well. I mean, they've come, they're now installed in cities in the United States. The Haitian communities have set up voodoo temples in the US. So, but apart from that, um, voodoo is pretty restricted. There, there are a lot of religions we don't hear about that are in the Caribbean. Uh, Santeria is in the Dominican Republic in Cuba. Um, and of course in the US, very popular here in Hartford as a matter of fact, there are Santeria temples all over the place on Park Street in Hartford. Um, and also on Albany Avenue uh, as well. Um, and then obviously in Florida, Miami, and places various parts of, of Florida. But there are other religions throughout the Caribbean. Um, the Spiritual Baptists are in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, the uh, Tsombe also is another one that you've probably not heard of, but these are small groups. What's been happening in the Caribbean now is that you have a lot of evangelical preachers, missionaries who are coming, mostly uh, Pentecostals who are coming to the Caribbean. And what's happened is that these old African religions like Voodoo and Santeria and Tombe and, and Spiritual Baptist and all of these religions have now become intermixed with evangelical Protestant tradition. And it's, a, it, it's, it's an interesting kind of stew that you've found now in various parts of the Caribbean. And then depending on where you're going to be, the influence, the evangelical influence is gonna be different as you travel from one island to the other. But uh, you do have that now, an intermixture of old African beliefs uh, and um, such as a cohort uh, in Haiti, which is, uh, has um, uh, a lot of the evangelical tradition from the Pentecostals, which are now, and the Adventists, which are now intermixed with voodoo to create something new that's called the court uh, religion. So you, you've got a lot of that going on in the Caribbean right now, but evangelical Protestantism has become very, very powerful, particularly the Pentecostals in, uh, in the Caribbean. And there is some sense of affinity between that tradition of Pentecostal and the African tradition, because uh, the music is the same very much, very rhythmical music, the possibility of using drums, for example. Uh, new music has been created out of the context of the two. Sometimes it's uh, American uh, evangelical music that's now put in the kind of rhythmic uh, West Indian pattern. And you also have, in this case, the same kind of preaching, you know, that you find both in both tradition. And then the other, of course, is the fact that people get taken over by the spirit and they speak in tongues 
which you also have in Santeria and you have it in Voodoo, you have it in Sombe, you have it in Spiritual Baptist, you have it in all of these other different religions in the Caribbean uh, and parts of Brazil. Uh, Bahia in Brazil has Candomblé and, and uh, Macumba. So all of these, so this the Protestant tradition fits very nicely. It, 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 it met, it had an affinity with the African tradition that was already there. So it was not at all difficult for them to combine very, very quickly. And it happened in, the, in just a matter of a couple of, uh, um, maybe 20 years or so, that it be, that and syncretism began to occur, yeah. Now that you may not know that, but the Mormons now have moved into the Caribbean and they are growing very, very, very quickly. They are everywhere in the Caribbean now. And uh, I have a student who is Mormon. Um, I had a student, but she's still at the college and she writes to me once in a while. She's writing right now a thesis and she's writing a thesis on Udu, which is interesting. But the Mormon church has become very interested in what she was doing. And she just wrote to me yesterday to tell me now they've invited her to come to Utah to give a, a talk on voodoo uh, at the Mormon church. So because they're moving into the Caribbean, they become very interested in other religions that are there. And they're really opening up. I mean, it's very interesting what's been happening to the Mormon church. But they're, they're fast growing in the Caribbean very quickly. Interesting, good question, Nancy. Um, any other questions that you might have for Leslie? Anyone? Lou, go ahead. Yeah, well, I, all you have to do is very intriguing for me because I find that one religion and another religion helps me to understand the religion that I'm in. Uh, and I, I see overlapping. And I appreciate some of the things that you just said tonight about the spiritualness is, is in these different religions. Uh, and I was wondering if there's anything more you can say regarding that. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, apart from the fact that I studied those religions in the Caribbean, but I also did a lot of work. Um, I mean, my minor was really in Hinduism and Buddhism. So, uh, Learning uh, other religions, I think in many ways, it's like a window into your own faith because you not only see a lot of um, parallel between the two similarities, particularly with Buddhism and Christianity, they're very close. Um, but the other is that, I mean, the stress is on um, charitable work, on compassion, which Jesus also talked about a lot. Right? I mean, the Sermon on the Mount, you know, that's what it's about, the Beatitudes, about the poor, the poor in heart, and so on. And Buddha also talked about that. So there are a lot of that, but it's just that it's, it's taking the Christian message and framing it, and it, framing it in a different way. Uh, and therefore, by looking at the way it's framed in Buddhism and other religions, it enriches your own tradition and your own spirituality. I think, Lou, that's what you're getting at. So you're shaking your head, but that, that's what I'm getting at. So that's why it's, I think it's so important for people who are Christians to also study the theology of other religions. And I know that personally, I've gained a tremendous amount uh, of understanding of my own faith by looking at these other religions. Uh, because I'm, I'm standing away and using another window and looking at Christ on the cross, for example, uh, the whole notion of servitude, the whole notion of giving yourself for the sake of another. Um, and, and, and that, that in itself is, uh, is very important, I think, in enriching one's personal spiritual life as a Christian. Amen. Um, how about we take one last question from Ginny? Hi. Um, you're muted. So hold on, let me help you out. There you go. Oh, oh I was just going to say that my husband was, was Jewish, and we used yeah. to visit synagogues in various areas, including this one. But he came to he came on Sunday to Asylum Hill, and we went to Emmanuel on Friday. 
Uh, but when we visited other countries, and I'm really getting old, I can't remember. I, I'm sure there was one down there in the, in the Caribbean, but I can't remember where I can, I can see it. it was in the roads ran from each side of it, but I can't remember the names on However, this was very interesting and I'm very interested to know that, you know, and I hadn't realized the two varieties of Judaism that were so predominant down there. And thank you very much. That was really great, Lizzie. Thank you. Thank you. Well, can I just have one, say one last thing? You know, usually you go to the Caribbean on vacation and we ended up going to the beach, you know, and, and just relaxing, but there's nothing wrong with that. And the Caribbean is a beautiful place. I've been to 15 different places in the Caribbean, different islands in the Caribbean. And I have to tell you, the, the one that I like the most is the one that has no beaches, and that's Dominica, which I think is absolutely a superb island. Um, but in any case, when you go visit, um, you know, you can go to the beach, which is okay, but uh, try to, to go off, you know, and go see a synagogue, go see a church, uh, you know, uh, use that opportunity to look into these uh, various religions uh, in the Caribbean. But if you happen to be in St. Thomas, please go see that synagogue in St. Thomas. It's small, but it's the cutest, cutest temple I've ever seen in my life. It's very small, it's beautiful. Uh, and it's a little bit like the synagogue in the Turo synagogue, which also is just as beautiful in a different way. But this is a very simple, so I showed you pictures of it, but it's a nice, serene, quiet place. It's on top of a hill. Uh, if you can't walk up the hill, take a taxi and go up there, but it's well worth going to see. It's a very beautiful place. Well, thank you so much, Leslie. And I love that your curiosity about this really grew out of your own curiosity while you were traveling. So thank you for those words of inspiration. And I want to thank everyone for coming. And if this is something that's interesting to you, um, the Adult Ed Committee is working on some programs. And we're actually working on exploring other facets of Christianity. So we're going to be offering a program about evangelical Christianity coming up in the future. And um, we're going to be learning more about other religions as well. But we're also really curious about our Christian neighbors and learning more about them. So stay tuned for more things. And I want to thank Leslie again for um, giving us the gift of his wisdom and expertise and research and scholarship. And thank you all so, so much for coming. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Stay thank well. You. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Thank you, Leslie. Good night. Okay, good night. Thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye, Mike. See you next time. Okay.